Hello, everyone. So, um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about electronic health record systems. Um, and our research is based in uh, Kenya, so I'm going to focus on Kenya. But before I get into what we're doing, I thought I'd give um, just a bit of an overview of what electronic health records are. And um, if there's any jargon I use, just stop me and I can explain it. Um, I'm quite a geek, so I kind of get carried away with jargon. But so an EHR is basically, these are normal health records stored in little paper files and they've been moved now in many hospitals across the world into electronic systems and some of them you can access them on iPads and things like that. So when I started as a doctor, I started in the year 2000 and it was the height of the dot-com boom so everyone was raving about technology and the internet and how everything was going to change and then when I turned up on the wards, I think my primary job actually was just to carry around these paper records which for some patients you had like a pile about this high which were totally, um, you couldn't search them, you couldn't um, quickly review them, couldn't tabulate any of the information. So I was quite keen to see if we could progress things and move things uh, electronically. So an, an EHR system generally, so you have the actual records themselves, which are um, pretty much the same as the paper records. So they're notes taken by doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals, um, which are stored in a computer database. But they're also generally now linked to lots of other systems. So if you go and have an x-ray in a hospital, quite often it will be a digital x-ray now instead of being kept on a film. And that will be stored in an electronic system. And the patients um, will be managed in a PAS, patient administration system. And this will also be linked to things like pharmacy systems. So they'll keep track of what drugs are in the pharmacy and who's been prescribed what. And laboratory systems. So if you have a blood test, that will be stored electronically and sent through to the electronic health record. And also we're now starting to see things like clinical decision support systems. And these are systems that plug into the electronic health record that help doctors and healthcare professionals make decisions. So they might say something like, let's look at the medication that the pharmacy's uh, providing to the patient and see if there's a conflict between two medications that mean that the patient shouldn't be on both of them at the same time. So since uh, 2000, when I started, you can see that over the last... 10 or 15 years, electronic health record use has really uh, taken off around the world. And it's quite interesting that the health IT industry probably might be one of the only industries that's really benefited from the global financial crisis. So lots of industries have all been collapsing and uh, people have been made redundant, but the health IT industry has been growing and growing. And one of the reasons for this was actually directly caused by the global financial crisis, because the uh, US government, uh, in response to the crashing stock market, one of the res normal responses in economics is to just put billions and billions of dollars back into the economy. And one of the areas they decided to spend money on was health IT. So they wanted to get all hospitals and clinics and doctors electronic using this money. So quite luckily for the health IT industry, the government, US government spent $25 billion on EHR adoption, and that was just money given to hospitals and doctors to buy uh, health IT systems. So over the past kind of five or six years, that money has been flowing into the system. We're seeing lots and lots of new systems, lots of companies getting very big. Um, and also during this time, the UK government, you might have seen this in the, in the newspapers, it's been quite widely discussed, but there was a programme called the National Programme for IT. And that was the idea behind that was if you get ill in Barnsley and you, get, uh, and you come from Birmingham, the doctor in Barnsley can look up your information on the com NHS computer system and treat you. Um, However, the system, the National Programme for IT system has cost about £10 billion uh, and has recently been scrapped in favour of a new way of doing things, which is to devolve the money directly to hospitals rather than having uh, one overall national system. So that's been a bit of a, a kind of mixed picture with the US um, putting in a lot of money in the UK, um, having big problems with implementing their, their, their programme of work. However... Um, Lots of other countries have done pretty well, and lots of countries now have pretty much 100% adoption of EHR systems, in, at least in primary care, but the hospitals as well are, are getting to that level. So why do we need EHRs? Why are they a good thing? If you talk to lots of people in the healthcare profession, they'll say they're terrible things. There's lots of surveys of doctors and nurses who say, I, you know, it's just made my life a misery working with the EHR. I can't do anything that I used to do. It's slow and more difficult. Well, I, I'd like to uh, take a quote from uh, Sir Mio Gray, who's been talking about this idea that clean, clear water transformed healthcare in the 19th century. But in this century, clean, clear knowledge will transform healthcare. So it's going to be bigger than any new medication, any new way of doing things. Use of uh, knowledge that's high quality and clear can help us um, improve healthcare. 
So how do they do that? Well, despite what a lot of people say about slowing down workload, there is a potential, it might not be um, fully realized at the moment, there's a potential for data to be uh, more quickly retrieved out of electronic systems than paper-based systems. Uh, they might be more accurate. Everyone knows that doctor's handwriting is terrible, but the reality is that if a nurse is giving a drug and they've only got doctor's handwriting to see what the dose is, they might get the wrong dose. And EHRs with digital information have a potential to um, reduce those kind of errors and also for all sorts of other things. Also, they can be more accessible. So um, you can have access to your EHR either on a tablet computer or on the hospital um, desktops or at home. And because the information is digital, you can see it anywhere. And also these clinical decision support tools that I talked about will take over more and more of the decision making that takes place in healthcare. So you, as you're, as you're making decisions, you're not just blindly making decisions, you're using data and using information that comes from the EHR. And finally, the secondary use of clinical data, which is kind of why we're interested in it at the moment and why we're interested in Kenya. So these EHR systems are being put in for the people in hospitals to work with. But as all this data is generated, researchers can then get access to that data and look at it and use it for either new research or for gathering information on how healthcare is managed um, in a country or in a hospital. But the problem is that EHR data are not clean and not clear at the moment. They're, it's a mess, really. There's lots of different types of systems. They don't talk to each other. Um, instead of uh, nicely categorizing things like diagnoses or um, your past medical history in nice tabular data that would be very easy to search, quite often it's just typed in. And so you then have to use um, natural language processing tools, kind of sophisticated ways of analyzing the text to try and pull out the kind of data points from it. Which is, just a, which is just messy and kind of not necessary, really. And then the other problem, which is pertinent to uh, Kenya, is that EHRs are really expensive. So here, um, just before they distributed all this money in the US, they did an exercise to evaluate how much money they'd need to distribute. And they came up with a five-year figure of $48,000 for an EHR. And that's a cost um, per doctor. So it's not per hospital or per clinic. It's per individual doctor. So you can kind of see why in the UK it's cost £10 billion pounds and in the US they're spending £25 billion. Pounds. But what does this mean for Kenya? Because Kenya doesn't have £10 billion um, pounds to spend on uh, IT. But they have been implementing EHR systems. So over the last um, 10 years probably, there's been a growth in systems in Kenya as well. And most of these systems have come from um, grant-funded projects. And they did a review of which systems are being used and who's funding them uh, in 2009. I think the review started in 2007, actually, and they published their report in 2009. But this was a review with um, a CDC-funded um, EMR systems, uh, systems that are used in the National AIDS and SDI Control Program, which is run out of the Kenyan Ministry of Health, and um, the HMIS assessment report. Now, HMIS was a new unit that they set up inside the Ministry of Health um, for health management information systems. So the Kenyan government has kind of seen that there's, there's a need for EHR systems and that they are being used by these large um, grant-funded projects, particularly around HIV and antiretroviral therapy distribution. So in their survey, they identified 33 systems um, that were in use. And then they started to develop uh, an e-health strategy. And if you look around developing countries, there's not many e-health strategies. And in fact, if you look at developed countries, there's not many e-health strategies. So quite often, e-health is part of the normal health strategy of a country with a bit on IT. But Kenya developed a, its own e-health strategy. And it was an initiative that was supported by the World Bank. And they had two programs, the Health in Africa Initiative and the Kenya Investment Climate Program, that contributed to uh, putting together a workshop and they brought together basically everyone in the country they could find who was interested in e-health and had some knowledge about it and came up with some principles for how they were going to take um, e-health forward, which developed into their uh, national strategy. And the idea was to um, support collaboration and partnerships for shared information and services so that hospitals can talk to government and talk to clinics and um, harmonising and coordinating what was becoming a more disparate situation in terms of lots of different systems all being developed in different ways with different standards. And around about the same time as they were doing that, the WHO was also developing a toolkit. And the idea behind the toolkit is to look at what's happened around the world in developed countries and to give some guidance to developing countries on how they formulate their, their strategy for their country. 
So it says things like um, develop a national e-health vision um, with consultation with everybody who's interested, and then develop an action plan, work with the stakeholders, um, integrate the different elements together and determine what um, resources you need at the government level and at the county level to get it implemented and then to monitor and evaluate as you're rolling things out. So don't just design everything and just leave, let it go, but continuously monitor and look at the situation and how it's going. So after they had the strategy, they um, developed a new document, which was for guidelines for EHR adoption. Now, this takes some of the um, knowledge that's been developed around the world in terms of how you integrate systems together and how you plan for the future. So they advise things like adopting international standards for data connectivity. So um, because of this problem of lots of different systems, around the world people have discovered that if you can say how you should share data with each other in a standard way, so that you always share data in the same way, then it allows the systems to talk to each other much uh, more efficiently. So they've detailed all the standards that they think should be applied in the different areas of electronic health records, the electronic pharmacy systems and the electronic lab systems. And then they did a review in uh, 2011 of how the systems that were currently in place were adopting those standards and those guidelines for how they should roll them out. And they reviewed 28 sites and found 17 different systems. Some of them are listed here. And they found that in particular the CPAD system and the IQ Care and OpenMRS were quite good at adopt adhering to these standards. So there's a bit of a kind of circular thing in that OpenMRS and IQ Care have been around for quite a long time and have been funded quite well in terms of these HIV and AIDS programs. Um, so they inform some of the strategy, but also they are adopting international standards. So this is where we came in. Um, so we decided that how can we help, how can, how can we um, um, move things on, but also um, achieve our objectives, which at the end of the day, we have a research objective. We want to be able to pull data out of these systems for research and try and influence policy and make improvements in the health sector. So we wanted to know what systems were out there and what kind of standards they were using, what, what the data was that was in these systems and could we um, extract it. So we've uh, been conducting an EHR survey, so we've been update, updating the survey from 2011 and expanding it. We've also been, um, we're looking at building a simulation, so the simulation will contain the elements of the health IT system in Kenya and see how they work together and how they um, share data. And then finally, we're going to have a process of co-design where we work with clinicians in Kenya to try and come up with new clinical interfaces to try and encourage adoption. So the aim of the survey was to find out which EHRs are being used in public hospitals. So there's lots of private hospitals in Kenya, but we're really interested in the public hospitals because those are the ones that we currently work with to pull data out. And we wanted to um, know which, which systems were being adopted and what the plans were for adopting new systems. We also wanted to assess the attitudes of the users, so the clinicians, but also the um, administrators. And we wanted to see how compliant they were with the standards and guidelines. Uh, so we could update this review done in 2011. And the final aim is, of the survey is uh, to develop recommendations for secondary use of data. So they might have their own objectives, but we wanted to make them aware of the possibility for reusing the data as well. So we've been using so far a snowballing technique. So the idea is there isn't really much knowledge of what systems are out there and how they're being used. So um, we've just been using personal contacts and following leads and finding air places we can go and visit. Um, we've been conducting semi-structured interviews with uh, leaders in the hospital and the IT management. And um, then we've been doing technical reviews of the systems that we have access to. So for some of the systems, they've given us web access to a server which contains our system so that we can go through it and we can uh, look at the guidelines and the use cases of how the system should be used and see how compliant they are. We've been putting the, t the technologies and the standards together into a traffic light report. And the idea behind this is to see, is so you can compare all the different systems and compare different hospitals in, in a kind of at-a-glance way. So the idea is that uh, if they're very compliant with certain standards, they might get a green. If they don't do clinical decision support, they might get a red for that. So in the end, you have this kind of colour-coded system so that you can see at a glance um, which systems are doing well and which systems are, are not. And you can also play that over time to see how people how it should all be going green. And then also we've been doing a thematic analysis of the interview data. So, so far we've visited um, 
few hospitals in, uh, in Kenya, mostly around the Nairobi region, um, and discovered quite a few different systems, some of which have been um, seen before in the 2011 report, and some of the new systems that haven't been seen before. Um, in terms of the new systems, so there's one called Zidi, and we went out to a hospital in Gatundu, which is a couple of hours out of Nairobi, and it's a level three hospital that um, when you go in, you kind of feel it's, it's a functioning hospital, it's working well, but it's fairly resource constrained. So patients are sitting in open air waiting rooms, there's long queues for the doctors. Um, but they all had these brand new Windows 8 computers on their desks with this uh, fancy new system that used touchscreen computers and a very modern user interface. And they'd actually had um, six developers working every day in the hospital for over a year developing this customized system just for this hospital. And a similar system, Sanitas, was in another few hospitals, again, using very modern technology, modern web frameworks, uh, young developers spending a lot of time, putting a lot of hours in creating a very customized system just for that uh, hospital. And then also these other systems that have been, they've been reviewed before in the 2011 report, um, but are also now um, growing as well. So OpenMRS and uh, IQ Care from IQ Solutions, which is part of the Futures Group. So the Futures Group is a um, global healthcare consultancy group that's been doing a lot of work with large aid projects. So I'll just, uh, there's a bit to say about OpenMRS, so I'll come to that in a moment. So our preliminary findings, and we haven't um, completed the survey, but there seems to be partial adherence to industry standards. So some areas are good and some areas are not so good. Um, they all pretty much are good at demographic data. That seems to be the primary purpose of most of them, just keeping a tabs on who's been attending the hospital and when. Um, all systems can generate lab reports and prescription orders, which seemed quite um, a positive um, finding. And all systems have got password and role-based security. Um, but in terms of things like encryption of backups and um, real uh, data security, we found that some of the systems were a bit lacking. The systems um, can generate uh, reports, so aggregated reports of what's going on, so how many people have admitted with a certain uh, condition, um, but they're generally not integrated into um, the government system, which is called DHS2. And so I'll talk a little bit about DHS2 in a minute as well. But they, the idea should be that they can electronically send data up to the government about, on how they're doing, uh, but currently what they do is they run a report on the computer and then they fill in forms or they print off forms and then send them up and then they get transcribed in. Um, the systems at the moment, they don't focus on interchanging with other systems. So in one hospital can't communicate with another hospital. Um, the systems aren't set up to do that. And none of the systems had uh, clinical decision support. So this idea of intervening when uh, someone's about to make a mistake when they're using the system or highlighting a, an alert that they need to do. In terms of what the users thought of the systems, um, there's quite a lot of um, disparity here, again, depending on the different systems. But... Uh, some of the themes that we got out of the um, out of the interview so far was that some people say it makes the work easier and faster, easier to access data and porting, and some error reduction and improved accuracy, which is along the lines of uh, what I was talking about before. But also include, improved monitoring and accountability. Um, some people say the systems are really user-friendly, and actually some of these new systems are really nice. They're much more user-friendly than a lot of the systems we use in the UK and elsewhere. Um, Improved patient confidentiality was another theme that came up, and improved interdepartmental communication. So within the hospital themselves, they can talk within departments using the electronic health record systems. But some people said the systems can be slow. Um, blackouts and power failure is a real problem. So it's not really encountered in the developed world with these EHR systems, but when the power goes out, quite often uh, there's no access to the system. Um, there's, there was some talk about these kind of workflow, business logic, and um, so features basically that they wanted but hadn't been implemented yet, and that was causing um, frustration. So some of the quotes, um, some, so this is a hospital administrator, hospital collections have increased more than four times over the last three years, so that's kind of making the business case for them. Uh, I wouldn't want to go back to working with the, with our, without the system. Uh, we can get our reports at the click of the button before it takes days to compile them. Um, diagnoses offered by the system sometimes don't match the clinician's impressions and sometimes they can click anything um, close to them so they can move on to the next item which obviously is creating kind of bad data in these systems. Uh, processes for fixing the systems takes long so a lot of the systems have been provided by one or two man companies and 
Uh, if they're supplying five or six hospitals and the hospital system has a problem, they've got to phone them up and they say, oh, well, I'm on the other side of the country for two weeks and I can come to you in two weeks and fix the system, which is a big problem. Um, and in blackouts, you know, they haven't provided for what's going to happen during a blackout, so everyone just waits until the system comes back, and if it doesn't, you know, nothing continues. So that's kind of where we are with our survey at the moment, and we, we we're going to um, expand it. We've just got some new funding to expand it um, a lot further than what, what we've been doing to get a more comprehensive picture and to do more in-depth technical evaluations. But I just wanted to talk a bit about um, OpenMRS. So we have another project, which is um, working with the Ministry of Health and the WHO in one of the counties in Kenya called Machakos County. And the WHO have funded an implementation of one of the systems, which is called OpenMRS. So OpenMRS is a big project that's been going, around, going for uh, 10 years or so. And it originally came about because some of these um, uh, uh, US-funded AIDS groups um, who were developing their own system for keeping track of what antiretrovirals they were uh, giving out and where the funding was going, uh, decided to come together and pool their resources to create one system that everyone can use. So that meant that they created an open source system that was free, and also they developed it in a way that was modular, which meant that you could plug in different modules to do different things. So OpenMRS in one clinic could be just about TB or HIV, and in another clinic it might be about something completely different. Um, but you can just plug in all these different modules to do different things. So the current state of play is that there's, there's now quite a few different types of OpenMRS system. So there's OpenMRS version 1, which is widely used for TB and HIV clinics. Uh, OpenMRS version 2, which is an, a, an upgrade of the whole system, but designed around um, moving more out of clinics to cover whole facilities and whole hospitals. And there's a hospital called Mirabalay in Haiti, where Partners in Health have been working for quite a few years, and they've basically built a very modern, expensive, high-quality hospital. And the software that they've used to uh, run it is the OpenMRS um, system. So um, the version 2 is basically uh, what they've developed in, in, in this Mirabale hospital to make it into a, um, into a more modern hospital system. In Kenya, they've adapted version 1 to, the, to, be called, to uh, this distribution called Kenya EMR. It's gone out to 600 or so clinics in Kenya, primarily for HIV and TB care. <coughs> and then there's also been some other developments. So Barney is a group um, which has been funded by a group called ThoughtWorks, which is, this, uh, health, which is this IT consultancy group out of the US. And they've been linking OpenMRS with other open source projects, so open source management systems, business management systems, and open source lab information systems. So where OpenMRS might be good for a clinic, it's not very good for a lab system or managing hospitals or billing. So they've linked it with these other open source projects to create a whole system. And um, OpenHMIS is a similar um, uh, project on a much smaller scale, but inside Kenya, uh, which we've been uh, looking at as well. And then finally, there's this new project called Kenya EHRS, um, which uses OpenMRS version 1 but has developed a whole load of new modules to cover these, these areas that aren't currently covered by um, the HIV clinic systems. So they've got something like 10 or 12 new modules around billing, patient management, inpatient care, uh, laboratory systems. Um, and that's the system that we've been uh, working with the Ministry of Health uh, as they roll it out in uh, Machakos County. So some of the groups involved in OpenMRS, there's ITEC, which is from the University of Washington and the University of California in San Francisco. And they've been supporting this Kenya EMR distribution. So version one going out to lots of small clinics across Kenya. Uh, the Ministry of Health have been, funded, have been funding over the last few years a big, a big rollout of that system uh, with um, the support of PEPFAR. Um, AMPATH, um, which is uh, out of the University of Indiana, and one of the co-founders of OpenMRS, and they're based in Eldoret in, uh, in Kenya, and they're using it for their programs, um, their US-funded programs as well. And then HISPINDIA and the WHO, so this is the project that I was just talking about, with using this OpenMRS in hospitals, building new modules. So HISPINDIA are a software group um, that work mainly with the DHS2 software, which I'll talk about in a minute, but have been um, rolling out OpenMRS in hospitals in India. And there's lots of kind of these small private hospitals in India where they all want an EHR system. So they've developed these plug-in modules to make OpenMRS suitable for um, Indian hospitals. And that's the system that's being now adapted to be rolled out in Kenya. 
So in terms of uh, what we want to do next, um, the idea is that currently there's, there's quite a few different uh, options available to the government. There's international best practice, there's adoption of standards, and then there's choice of systems as well. And it's a bit difficult to evaluate things as um, before you've implemented them. And even as you're implementing them, uh, things take priority over evaluation. So we thought it might be a good idea to try and put the different systems that are being uh, uh, proposed together in a in silico simulation. So we'd, run, we'd get Amazon cloud servers and have them represent things like hospitals and clinics and government departments, and then install the open source software that's going to run on them. OpenMRS has a sample database of 5,000 or so patients, putting that into the, into the clinics and seeing if you can move a patient, say, from a clinic into a hospital, or send data from a hospital to the government into their DHS2 system. So all these listed here are open source projects that together could potentially uh, cover the different elements of a health IT system in a developing country. So DHS2, this is a, a system out of the uh, University of Oslo um, that's widely used um, for gathering data on statistics, on health statistics. So the way it's used in Kenya is they have a server that the government controls and hospitals can log on to the server through a web form and enter in data or upload a spreadsheet of data. And the idea is that um, they'll gather all the data and it can be submitted to um, WHO or the government can use it for planning. But because the data is currently manually entered, so it might be that there's a clerk in a hospital that goes through the, um, the records, tabulates things and then puts it into the data, there's lots of opportunities for the data to not be very good. So one of the big pushes behind the adoption of standards-based EHR systems is so that the, uh, the doctors put in the data as they need it for their work, and then the data is extracted automatically out into DHS2. The other element of this simulation is to um, uh, promote interoperability with systems, and the people behind OpenMRS have got a new system for helping with that called OpenHIE. And OpenHIE is, is an open source system designed to help pull the data together from different systems. So it's likely that you're not going to get one system in a country, you're going to get lots of systems. But if they can adhere to certain standards, you can pull, them, pull the data out together. And then finally, we want to adopt this process of co-design. So quite often with clinical IT systems, they're designed by a company, purchased by management in a hospital and put in and then the doctors and nurses are expected to use it and quite often what happens is the doctors and nurses don't use it and that's something we've seen quite a lot in Kenya, it's seen around the world. So we want to um, promote a process of co-design and because with the open, open MRS system it's a modular system, you can potentially develop a module that you've developed with users to be the interface to the database. So what we're proposing to do is to develop a new module which is around paediatric inpatient care so Mike English, who leads our group, is a paediatrician based in Kenya and has a good network of paediatricians who are all um, in, involved in gathering data. And we want to work with them through workshops and a process of uh, continuous iteration uh, to try and improve how they enter data into the system, make it user-friendly, so that when you do put it into hospitals, the clinicians will want to use it and the data will be accurate and representative of what the doctors are doing rather than not. So that's all I wanted to talk about today, really. But... In summary, I think the answer for um, the question of what's going on in Kenya in terms of EHRs, there seems to be fairly rapid adoption of EHRs in Kenya, pretty much similar to how there's been adoption of EHRs around the world. And what we don't want to do is have um, a situation that, to mimic what's happened in other countries where you end up with lots of systems that don't talk to each other and we can't exchange data. So we kind of feel that if we can get involved with the process, add a bit of um, insight into what's been going on around the world and how things uh, could happen. It might enable um, countries to adopt a sensible strategy in terms of sharing data and we want to see how that's going and evaluate it and report back to the world as well on what Kenya's doing as a, as a leader in this area, I think. So thank you very much. <laughs>